Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Today we are going to talk about a new paradigm in healthcare called the value uh, paradigm. And the idea is pretty simple. It just puts the patient at the center of the healthcare navigation system. And what I mean by that, and what our illustrious panel will, will explain in the next uh, hour or so, is why that's so different from what we're doing now. It focuses on outcomes, not on inputs. And that really is a, a fundamental reworking of the way we do healthcare globally now. Um, and there are some exceptions to this, and we'll talk about that. But um, first, though, before we talk about the old paradigm, I, want, I mean, the new paradigm, I want to talk about the old paradigm. And, and to do that, before we do anything, I'm going to introduce these extraordinary guests here. Uh, my immediate left is Lori Glimsher, who is the president and CEO of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Uh, this is next to her is Franz van Houten, who is the uh, chief executive officer of Royal Phillips. Um, then we have Omar Ishrak, who is the chairman and CEO of Medtronic. Next to him is Bruce Broussard, uh, Broussard who is the president and CEO of Humana. And finally, on the, on the far, far left, is Christoph Weber, who is the uh, president and CEO of Takeda uh, Pharmaceuticals. Thank you all uh, to these incredible guests. This is an amazing group because what we're going to, we picked this group because it covers pretty much every aspect of the healthcare continuum, um, except, of course, the patient, although I'm sure we're all patients in some way. Um, but to talk about that, I would love to get this first slide up here because. Um, this is the old paradigm. And what you can see here, right behind, right over the heads, unfortunately, of, of some of our panelists, is the health adjusted life expectancy uh, uh, globally. And um, what health adjusted life expectancy means is it's life expectancy when you're healthy. So the last part of this, you know, the years that you're sort of not healthy is. is is uh, phased out of this, this particular chart. And we can see that this is graphed against the expenditures and emerging economies versus developed economies, light blue for emerging and dark blue for uh, the dots or developed economies. And you can see we've pretty much topped out. The, it doesn't matter how much we spend per capita, at this point in the current system, we are really at this place where uh, we're not making much more progress. We're spending more and more for less and less. And in fact, this was shown in the United States at least, uh, just recently, where the life expectancy dropped for the second straight year, the first time that's happened, happened in more than half a century. So Lori, as a physician, as an immunologist, as someone who runs one of the most uh, renowned academic medical centers in the world, um, you see firsthand uh, the challenges uh, from just taking care of people, the health. What, what are we doing wrong? So let me start out first by doing a reality check. Mm -hmm. And that is, let's remember that at the turn of the century, 1900, the average lifespan was 40. So. There has been a lot of progress over the last hundred and some years. But nevertheless, we are looking forward to a time where life expectancy probably will decrease. And I think most recently that has been in part because of the opioid epidemic of substance abuse. But leaving that aside, you know, all of us want to deliver the very best care with the very best treatments to everybody globally. And I think that you know, there are probably four categories where we need to improve in order to reverse mm. the trend. And one of them is in basic research. So we still have not discovered many of the key proteins that we need to target with drugs. So basic research is essential, and hence the health of all academic medical centers is critical. And perhaps we can say a little more about that later. But just remember that academic medical centers are in a perfect storm right now. It's where the majority of basic research and new transformative discoveries take place. It's where at Dana-Farber, for example, the new protein against which the most used immunotherapeutic 
the PD-1 blockers, arose from a basic discovery. So we're not there in terms of basic research, but at the same time, academic centers are in huge jeopardy. It's a perfect storm, as I said, because healthcare reimbursements are not increasing at the same rate as medical costs. Mm -hmm. That's not a good <laughs> balance to have. And secondly, the funding for basic research has declined. From the NIH, 20% decline in real dollars over the last decade. So this is a perfect storm. And I think we don't want to jeopardize the very best academic medical centers because this is where basic research is going to come from. And frankly, if we're not doing basic research and figuring out how to treat diseases we still don't know how to treat, like obesity, like diabetes, like many kinds of cancer, then healthcare costs are going to continue to rise. The second category is making sure that all physicians know best practices. And that is, what is the best treatment for this patient? So we have to disseminate that, mm -hmm. and we have to provide education. And we're doing that at Dana-Farber, hopefully in collaboration with Philips, by our clinical pathways, where we have come up with a whole set of this is the best standard of care. Because 90% of care is delivered locally in communities. And they, these patients don't necessarily have access to the very best treatment plans. I think that's second. The third is, of course, cancer prevention, early screening. Well, let's just save the prevention issue for let's later just, on. Let's save so that for just, later on. Yeah. But that is absolutely We'll definitely critical. come back to it. But you know, the there fourth, was a terrific, oh, you've got a The fourth, a more, of course, yeah. is value-based reimbursement right. for expensive drugs. So we're gonna, that's what this, we're going to talk about for the next hour. Bruce, though, I mean, that was a fantastic framing, and it's a stark framing of our challenges. Bruce, last week I, I heard you talk at J.P. Morgan, and, and one of the issues was, uh, whether people who even have insurance and they are employed and they have access to care, they still defer care a lot because of the cost of this. So again, even when you look at you know, the developed circles and the money we're spending on this, there's still a lot of people who are holding back because they can't afford it. And this is your world and you, you're an insurer. Right? Well, Cliff, thanks for having us. Um, I would imagine in the US, we are probably the farthest one over to the right in the yeah. cost uh, we are. Um, we are. Uh, the bucket there. Um, and part of our, I, I think there's a sort of a, a good and bad to, to the progression of science, and that is we are living much longer as, a, as mm -hmm. a country and as a world as a result of the progression and over the years. And, and, I, and that's good, but what also has happened is, is our lifestyle as a result of having all the conveniences we have, um, have allowed us to live a life of luxury, mm -hmm. but it's also allowed us to create these chronic conditions. And I know in our population, which is primarily seniors, uh, we see a, you know, four or five chronic conditions. And what we have found is, is that if prevention isn't attain, mm -hmm. uh, those conditions progress. And just to give you an example, if someone has a mild uh, or a low uh, severity of diabetes, it usually costs us around $1,000 per member mm -hmm. per month. If they progress and they start having foot ulcers, start um, uh, eyesight is uh, deteriorating, even up to amputations or blindness, uh, we start to, our cost expenditures increase to four or $5,000 on a per member um, on a per month basis. And that's not a, that doesn't uh, represent all the casualties in their life. And what we found is that some of the simple things that make the difference. And what we've also found in our, in our research is, is that people delay their care. Uh, we talk a lot about, especially on the employer side, where we have a high deductible plan. There's a lot of people that can't afford that high deductible uh, or their deductible, and so they're preventing from having d the proper drugs. They're not uh, going to the doctor for the proper screenings. Um, they're not getting their, um, in specific uh, conditions like diabetes or other, their uh, particular uh, insulin, for example. And so what we see is delayed care, mm -hmm. and we call these things high-valued services where prevention, medical uh, prescription adherence really makes a large impact. Just one other thing to that. And the, and the problem we see is in the lower income populations, 
they are hurt the most. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that have four times more chronic conditions um, because of some of the lifestyles that they live in and, and, and the complexity of their life. And then secondarily, their ability to afford it is much less. And so you have this sort of this um, spiral that happens mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's in a population that is needing help, but they can't afford it. So we have a broken system and again, uh, as, as great as Lori's and Bruce's comments, where you all know from your own experience with uh, various healthcare systems that, that there are things that are broken. And, and it's true that we've come a long way since the turn of the last century. Um, but there is a new paradigm, and that's what we're here to talk about. And the World Economic Forum has spent uh, two years uh, working on um, a project uh, that will help define this and actually put it into a proof of principle, uh, which they've been doing now. Um, we'll talk about that later. But, but first, what is it? So you see all this cost that, that, that Bruce talked about before, uh, and $8 trillion at a global spend uh, this year. We're, uh, across the globe, we're going to spend $8 trillion on health care. That is projected to go up to $18 trillion. $18 trillion by 2040. Now, that's an unthinkable number. Um, and yet, we're not, as we've seen, getting the sort of outcomes we want. So how do you change that so that instead of a uh, patient's navigating an increasingly complex, uh, bizarre healthcare labyrinth, that, that now that labyrinth kind of rotates around the patient. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. In fact, Omar, since you worked, you're the executive board on this, this program, or, as well as Bruce and Chris, Christoph as well. Omar, why don't you talk a little bit about why this is such a different paradigm? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. The, the concept of uh, value-based care, which is improving outcomes at the lowest possible cost, is something that you can't really argue with. How can that be bad for anyone? Right. And uh, all of us who are in healthcare, uh, in the end, our sense of purpose has led us to work in this field for that very reason. So the alignment, the philosophical alignment around this topic is really not that difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the biggest issues is that our system has been built over decades in a way in which payment mechanisms and accountability has not been structured in a way that you're actually paid for value. Mm. Instead, you're paid for a service. Uh, with the expectation and the promise that value would be delivered. But when you just make promises at scale in a complex environment, there are many things that fall through the crack because no one's really accountable for the result. And so uh, the challenge here is to shift the entire system and all the stakeholders with a accountability for care and that's a big challenge. Now, once that's done, I think it's good for everybody. I mean, we fund programs. People come to us. Uh, you know, people who work for us come, come to me and sort of present programs for which they want money. And mm -hmm. every program has some kind of value at the end of it. Otherwise, it won't come. Now, how can it be bad to get paid for that? And so, but the system as such, with so many stakeholders, is not supported today. And that's why that's a challenge. But it's extremely important that we get on that, because I think that's the root cause for the cost issue and uh, you know, some of the graphs, the data that you showed. So we've got different kinds of stakeholders here. And Franz, I want to come back to you in just a minute. But, but Christoph, uh, your, your whole business is based on selling you know, drugs, selling medicines to people. And you could argue that they, there is a tremendous amount of value in those drugs, and I'm sure you will argue that, and I hope you will argue that. Uh, but the challenge is, how do we measure that, and how do you make sure that people are getting the kind of value from a medicine? How do you tie that to an outcome? Talk a little bit about that, if you Yes. Um, I mean, first, it looks very simple. So uh, it's a very <laughs> simple formula. Right. I mean, nobody can argue against it, but it's highly disruptive because what we need to acknowledge if we follow this path is that there are different outcomes based on which hospital we go, you go, based on you know, which medicine you choose, and that the medicine has not been designed uh, with that type of mindset. Uh, doctors uh, were not bind to outcomes, they were bind to we, th my job is to do the best for you. And so it's a very disruptive model. Um, but of course, in order to get there, first you need to measure. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is the value of that uh, model, is that today we spend uh, $8 trillion 
we, we don't measure a lot outcome. Uh, if you look at the type of measurement we do today in the healthcare system, it's very little. You, you can do that only if you measure outcome and you set up systems to measure outcome. And I think this is a real value that you gain from such a system is that you end up doing partnership with healthcare provider, with insurance company, uh, with patient, uh, with uh, medicine company, pharmaceutical companies to generate data so that you can measure outcome. And then the, le the level of discussion is totally different and it's not transactional anymore, it's really a partnership to understand this data. So, you know, that's a perfect transition to France because, you know, really at the heart of a lot of this is, is measuring. Um, it's informatics. If we had called this session bioinformatics, none of you would have come. Uh, so we, we, we call it the value healthcare paradigm. But, but Franz, your company uh, now, um, the appliances are gone, the lighting's gone, all the old Philips that people knew for 120 some odd years is gone. This is a health company now. Um, and a huge part of what you do is informatics. And you know, measuring at a, at a biological scale, at, to some extent a molecular scale, what is actually happening when, uh, when there are these interventions? I, I take a slightly wider context and then I'll come to and answer your question. So I mean, many of the panel, panelists have spoken about the need for a system change, mm -hmm. and I agree with that. But the danger of saying we need a systems change is that we all wait until the systems change happens, and that is a kind of a game Mm -hmm. Chicken, you know, who, who moves first, who blinks. And uh, so that's a slow process. Now, I, I'm hopeful because in the meantime, we can do a lot. Uh, Dr. Noseworth of the Mayo Clinic yesterday in the Wall Street Journal had an article. He said the best medicine is teamwork. Mm -hmm. I, you just said, you know, one of the things we need to do is best practice. Right. right? And then uh, Crystal says we need to measure. All of these things, teamwork, you know, best mm -hmm. practice, measurement can be done today Right? Uh, by organizing ourselves better. So the equation of value-based care, outcomes over cost, we can measure both. Mm -hmm. right? We can start measuring uh, outcomes, we can start measuring cost. But it has to be done um, patient-centric. Because if you, otherwise it becomes very abstract, right? We start saying, well, population health, but I always say that's one patient at a time, right? And there's a lot of people that work very hard to get better outcomes. So. Uh, we need to tear down the silos in healthcare within the hospital, first of all, right? And then hopefully between primary care and the hospital and, you know, the skilled nursing facility, make sure that that whole flow of the patient is starting to be optimized. So patient-centric care means you need to measure everything around the care pathway of mm -hmm. that patient. You need to start correlating information from uh, you know, a radiology image to a pathology uh, data source to genomics and bring that together. Uh, so many mistakes are made in all those professional silos that we can reduce cost by just optimizing healthcare delivery, by adopting best practice. Now, we have put a big investment on health informatics because it's a great way to tear down silos to make information flow with the patient so that the whole dossier can be integrally evaluated. We can correlate pathology and radiology and genomics data, get to a precision diagnosis, and then come to predictive care pathways as what is the most effective for this patient given their genome, and, and then put it in the hands of doctors. We call that clinical decision support systems, right? Where, by the way, artificial intelligence will support the doctor, not mm -hmm. replace, but support the doctor in understanding you know, what is the matter and how do we help this patient. So technology can actually help tearing down the silos, m become more patient-centric, and optimize, let's say, the, ch the, the, the chance for a better outcome at lower cost. So, so I think that's very important. I, I want to drill add? down on what's different. Yeah, go ahead. So, so may I just add to yeah. that by providing perhaps an example, because I completely agree with Franz here. What Franz is talking about, of course, is precision medicine, pre precision prevention, et cetera. So how do you do that? Because think, th let's take immunotherapy for an example, right? There are two drugs out there right now, but there are many, many more in the pipeline, and we all know that the treatment of cancer is going to require combination therapy. That's how we turned HIV into a man manageable disease from a lethal disease, was putting drugs together. 
Same thing is going to be true for cancer, but how on earth are we going to do the huge numbers of clinical trials, there's over a thousand now, in a way that's affordable? We have to be able to predict ahead of time which patient needs which drug ahead of time before you treat them. Because, you know, drug costs are still only about 14 to 17 percent of all health care. They are expensive, and I, I know we need to do something about that, but still, remember, it's, it's a minority of a health care cost. So what we really need to do is to develop algorithms from a combination of patient records which measure outcomes. So the patient first comes in, you get their genomics, you get their imaging, you get their pathology, and you then continue doing that when they're treated with a drug. And you say, okay, what was the outcome? What was the pathology? What was the radiology? Can we now predict before we treat that patient, if we have enough patients, and at Dana-Farber, we have 25,000 patient records and 25,000 patients whose genome has been sequenced. We're going to be sequencing their immunoprofile as well. We have pathology that's being digitized. We have radiology that's being digitized. We need to develop the algorithms so that we can, in fact, do neural net learning. We can do machine learning, because right now the algorithms aren't good enough to do that. But that's the, that, to me, five years from now or less, maybe 10 years from now, we're going to be able to look at a patient and say, this is the drug you need. And that's going to save a heck of a lot of money if we treat the right patient with the right drug. So in terms of informatics, do we know what it is that we need to collect in terms of data? Because you mentioned genomics. You met transcriptomics, the microbiome, do we need microbiome. to know the epigenetics, do we need right. to know the microenvironment signaling there, what sort of other proteins are active. There's so much happening, all RNA, of that. all of that, all all of that. that. but... Even today, yeah. and uh, you know, we, 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 we brought out an, uh, uh, an electronic way to do the tumor board meetings in hospitals, mm -hmm. right? really bringing everything together patient-centric. And in an academic hospital in Europe, we found that 30% of the cancer patients were either over or underdiagnosed, over or undertreated. Mm. And that's an academic institution, right? So by just putting the data together across the various silos of the hospital, you can get to a massive improvement of cost versus outcome. And so again, I, I plead not only to look at, you know, what's right. out there for 10 years because it put people into a complacent mode, notwithstanding your need for your budgets on R&D, I agree with that, but we can do so much to improve effectiveness today. So, because a lot of the challenges we don't really know, we didn't know 10 years ago what's important today in terms of information. I mean, again, immunotherapy, that 100-year-old science was still in infancy, at least in terms of our, in terms of the excitement factor, the buzz factor of seeing real responses like we have. And so looking at, you know, whether we wanted to collect a different kind of measure on that. But Omar, one of the challenges of this is standards, right? So we've got all, part of the huge thing, that uh, this fundamental thing you need in this new paradigm is some way, some baseline to measure. Because if you don't understand what the baseline is, you can't know who's doing better or who's doing worse or how much you're spending versus what you're getting. And the challenge with standards is, you know, we love standards. We, that my, my friend Dave Vegas says, we love standards so much that we have so many of them, you know. So how do you, how do you focus on what you need um, to create this system-wide change? Um, well, actually, the fact that you have many standards depending on the types of outcomes you're talking about, is probably a good thing. Because you've got lots of diseases, you've got lots of conditions, you've got lots of cohorts, risk. You can't expect all of them to meet the same standards. Mm. So I think uh, I'm a little bit uh, in um, sort of uh, building on what Franz mentioned as to what, you know, there's, there's already problems. And I think uh, picking out specific cohorts of patients, mm -hmm. defining outcomes, which are standardized for that disease state and that risk stratified patient is the way to do this. Now, maybe you have a methodology through which we set those outcomes, but the outcomes aren't all going to be the same. In fact, they're going to be different even for a specific disease depending on the risk stratification of the patient. The age, the comorbid conditions, and so on might lead to a different outcome than someone with a different 
condition to start with. Mm. So I, I think the process is what mm. needs to be standardized. The data itself, you know, is going to be different depending on the patient. Mm. Uh, but the, the, let's not underestimate what it's going to take to actually define these outcomes because today they don't exist. And if you cannot define the outcomes in a measurable way, mm. to your point, you cannot baseline. And right. if you cannot baseline, you cannot improve. Or maybe you think you improve, but you cannot prove that you improve. Right, as we've seen, we saw that first right. scary chart. We exactly. Think, we think we're improving, but we're not. Yeah, Lori. So let's bring up a subject that is a difficult subject, and that is end of life care and what is appropriate. Because oh, we're talking yeah, about. I thought it was going to be a different difficult subject. Health care uh, costs, right? But, you know, let me give you a little example here. Uh, my older son is a thoracic surgeon, and a patient was admitted to a hospital, which will remain nameless, a 96-year-old woman who had ex advanced Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. because she had very tight aortic stenosis. And he assumed that, of course, she would be treated with compassionate care and have a peaceful end of her life, which was only going to be a few weeks. But instead, the surgeon took her in and replaced her aortic valve. She spent three weeks in the ICU at great cost, and then she died anyway. So I do think mm -hmm. the United States is, I think, the biggest problem here. Um, we, I think, believe that if a technology exists, you should use it, no matter whether it is appropriate or not and compassionate for that person. We're going to be seeing an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. One out of three people over the age of 85 is going to have Alzheimer's disease. We have no treatment for that. Mm -hmm. If we had a treatment, if we could even delay that by five years, it would be an enormous... We're already spending $250 billion in the U.S. taking care of Alzheimer's patients. It's predicted to be over a trillion in 2040. And yet, how much money are we putting into biomedical research to try to figure out how to treat Alzheimer's disease? Right. Now, in the, in the, many in the private sector will say, okay, well, if we don't, if we don't try out some of these new techniques and some of these new products and the new devices and new drugs, our innovation pipelines will dry up. We won't be able to, you know, do the kinds of um, reinventions that we've seen in recent years in some cases. Um, you know, Christoph, I mean, part of the, the fear of, you know, this, any time you start to talk about clamping down on something is that the innovation pipeline will dry up. Um, I mean, this is something that I know um, drug makers have, and, and others have, have, have talked about quite a bit. Uh, no, I, I am totally in favor to, to debate this end-of-life care because, right. because uh, I, I mean, I think this is a necessary debate because we, we, we see it in every society. It's interesting that every country is not responding this, in the same way and it's actually interesting to see differences depending on the, on the culture. Uh, but there is, I think, the necessity to, to look at that. I, I, I think the research for innovation is, is slightly adjacent to that. You take Alzheimer. I mean, for example, Takeda is very much dedicated to neuroscience and searching still uh, in, uh, for uh, treatment for Alzheimer disease. I think that I think we'll continue to, uh, to research. And the, the key, actually, for Alzheimer is can we find, can we generate data which uh, allow an early intervention, earlier intervention. Right. So yeah. can we better uh, detect, potentially find some marker to detect who is more at risk of Alzheimer's? And there is a lot of science uh, uh, generating in this area. And then eventually find a treatment, but for more early intervention rather than late. Uh, I think that's how uh, the, the system will evolve. So, Bruce, I mean, every time somebody mentions some new device or treatment or other, you've got to pay, take out your wallet and pay for it. I mean, you're a, you're a payer. That's, you know. So, you know, the, the concern, obviously, is that when we talk about all the testing we need and the new, you know, informatics and things like that and the new sophisticated machinery and even some of the, um, you know, new, newfangled drugs, um, that's, that's coming out, so you have to pay for that. I mean, so how do you, how do you under, imagine what the paradigm has to look like uh, for you to get that, the most value out of that? 
Well, similar to what Omar was talking about is, is that if we look at it over a, a not a particular treatment, mm -hmm. but you look at it over a condition, mm -hmm. you look at it over treating somebody over a period of time. And, and for us, we, our average customer stays with us for seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there are interventions early on in that relationship or during that relationship that we can impact that condition, whether the condition is cancer to diabetes to, to um, you know, a COPD, or, uh, then we are all in. We're all in. And, and so we're less about the utilization of a particular treatment. We're not more focused on how does that extend life and how does that extend the health of somebody and prevent the disease from progressing. So, um, you know, so you said you, your average patient stays with you or customer stays with you, how long? Ten, seven to 10 years. Seven to 10 years. The problem with, so cancer is a multi-decades in progression, cardiovascular disease, multi-decades in progression, dementia, Alzheimer's could be many decades in progression. A lot of the things we're thinking about, if we're really thinking about moving to a prevention paradigm, how do we figure out in this model or another model, how to pay for that if you're only, you know, I mean, if you're going to pay for somebody for seven years and you're not going to see the benefit of the redu reduced uh, burden of disease, it's pretty hard to get you and others. Yeah, Franz. Well, we need to make a distinction between primary prevention and secondary prevention, mm -hmm. right? So if you have a primary prevention issue, make sure the person doesn't get sick in the first place. Mm -hmm. right. You need to think about education, food habits, uh, environment, uh, uh, pollution. But secondary prevention is where the big cost savings can be made near term, mm -hmm. right? And there I would argue seven to nine years That's is long, long enough. <laughs> right. Because uh, in that time you can optimize a whole lot. Yeah. And, and there I think better collaboration between uh, the various industries uh, mm -hmm. can help, right? The care providers, the payers, technology companies. And now we need to demonstrate that innovation has clinical outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and Christoph, you mentioned, you know, medication compliance, right? all of that. We, and here is where I think the, the IoT and, and mm -hmm. the cloud really is going to help us to create new models of engagement with patients to help them, first of all, in lower cost settings, mm -hmm. but secondly, uh, tying the data together to make sure that somebody, for example, you mentioned COPD, you know, that has uh, um, uh, support to to breathe, that they are compliant to that treatment, that we can give them coaching uh, every morning, you know, how did it go? Mm. That we can demonstrate to the payer and to the doctor, you know, how is this patient doing, right? That, I think, is already a big breakthrough. Right. Yeah. So I agree that primary prevention is absolutely critical. 80% of lung cancers are due to smoking. 30% of all cancers are due to smoking. And we and many other cancer centers and institutions, of course, have pr programs out there in the community. But we have another huge epidemic, which is obesity. And it is incredibly hard to change people's behavior. I'm not saying we shouldn't be trying to do it. And I think some of these new smartphone apps will help mm -hmm. so that you're always in contact with, with the person. But ultimately, we need a pill that will reduce appetite or that will, you know, prevent, that will induce satiety. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to be negative about the impact of behavioral changes. I'm positive about that, but mm -hmm. I think ultimately this is going to require, again, more basic research and the generation of more. We don't have enough drugs. The drugs that we have available target only six Hundred proteins. We have twenty thousand proteins. Mm -hmm. We got a, we got a, a huge amount left to discover in terms of new pathways so, and new so drugs. So, Cliff, I think yeah. I think um, there's probably different um, um, uh, timelines we're looking at. I think in the when we look at our cost today, we are we are with a population that has a high degree of chronic conditions. Oh. Um, we have to deal with those. I think there's through science and other mechanisms, maybe our education system and other investments, we can deal with some of the, the earlier um, prevention programs. But in today's world, there's a, and I think this is a little bit what was talked about 
a few minutes ago, there's a lot of things we can do as a, as a system that can improve. And let me, let me give you a story. We, we ran a predictive model a number of months ago to identify patients that were highly likely to have foot ulcers. We identified, and I'll use, use a name, Jimmy, who was in the southeastern part of the states, as an individual that was going to have that. We reached out to Jimmy, and we have these, these consumer persona, personas that identify how they engage. Um, so Jimmy was a control seeker. He doesn't listen to people. He doesn't, um, he doesn't what, take people's advice. Um, he doesn't know it all, so to speak. And so you really have to come and build trust with him. He doesn't trust, trust him. So we had a wonderful nurse that reached out to Jimmy and asked a little bit about his lifestyle and really was trying to dig into, did he have foot ulcers? And he did. He had a very large uh, foot ulcer, about the uh, size of a coin. And he, had, he weighed about 250 pounds. He was on 25 medications. And we began to understand how he pursued through the healthcare system. He hadn't been to a podiatrist in uh, uh, six months. Mm -hmm. His primary care doctor really treated the foot ulcer one time, but he didn't have the ability to go back to that primary care doctor because of the deductibility and because of transportation. Mm -hmm. He was, had a bar tab down the street with a pharmacist, um, of, and he was deciding what drugs he could take. And through the collaboration between us having a relationship with him for a long period of time, um, with a proper primary care doctor, a home health nurse, and some preventions, we were able to take care of the foot ulcer that didn't progress to an amputation. Um, we were able to get medical adherence um, in the proper level and, and be able to get him on his 25 drugs. He lost 50 pounds as a result of giving him a nutritionist. And at the same time, he's living a better lifestyle. But that's, to me, where I think about this two stages we're in. One stage, we have to deal with the population we have today. And the collaboration and understanding of how to engage with a member or a patient, and then be able to take these primary delivery capabilities mm -hmm. and help them, while developing science to prevent the next wave of population to not have the same chronic conditions or behavioral change or whatever it may be. So, you know, so that's, that's a great example of what a single company can do with new technology and smart thinking. But in terms of systemic transformation, I mean, so the World Economic Forum and this value project has created a pilot program uh, in Atlanta um, to see if they can improve outcomes um, in a dramatic way on, on congestive heart failure. <laughs> Uh, so this is a big city trying to, to, to work across 40 different organizations systemically. Omar, I know you're involved in this, Bruce, as well. I, I, Omar, why don't you just tell people about that? Because I, I think it's a fascinating, you know, test project. Well, yeah, I, see, one of the underlying themes of that is what's mm. already been discussed, that you've got to pick a certain condition. In this situation, that's clearly chronic and it's fairly advanced. And there's probably a lot of money being spent on it. And, you know, that has got its own story of the, of the sort that Bruce just related in a different condition. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if you did a survey there, you'd find all kinds of patients in different stages of heart failure being treated in different ways. So that project uh, focused on a certain condition. And one of the first things you do is try to stratify what are the different subconditions within that, mm -hmm. define what the expected outcomes are for each of those conditions. A lot of this is already known. It's what the expectation should be. And then what are the variables that are required to impact, mm -hmm. connect the outcome and the cohort together? Uh, and, and I think a study like that with a population in a certain specific area, area with multiple stakeholders, from payers to providers, mm -hmm. to technology companies, to drug companies, all, but not all trying to compete with each other, but all working together, working in the appropriate space where they can help each other get that outcome. And as you do that, you not only have a, a clinical value, you also have economic value at the same time because you stop a lot of wastage. Let, let me just uh, make one more point there. Yeah. One of the things that's become apparent as well, and I, I, Bruce kind of alluded to it, um, is that in all these studies, especially when you look at any population of any, any size, the social 
uh, factors and the behavioral characteristics of individuals actually are uh, extremely important criteria and sometimes more important than their disease because you know you can treat them but they're not compliant Be uh, one patient is compliant another is not compliant yeah and you have to manage them differently so that angle i think in studies like this come out to the top i mean bruce mentioned the transportation problem you know because it may be an economic uh, situation of an individual patient and you can get groups like that and although the clinical pathway in principle should be the same you've got an overriding social and economic management as well that has to be integrated with this, otherwise you won't see the results. So, so those know, are some of the learnings you get from a study like that. I know Franz and Laurie both wanted to jump in. I just want to let, let the audience know in a minute, I would love to get some questions from you or some, just some quick questions for the audience. So, but uh, so just think about that perhaps. Yeah. yeah, well, a few, I mean, so we all, I think, seem to agree that there is a lot possible. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the beginning, I said, let's not talk too much about system change uh, mm -hmm. because we can do so much. But this discussion around you know, secondary prevention does require some kind of a yeah. systems change. Um, the first systems change needs to relate to the same data that is the promise, right? Mm -hmm. um, we all entrust our financial health to the cloud. We have our social life in the cloud. But many countries in this world are schizophrenic when it comes to health data, mm -hmm. right? And in Europe especially. Uh, in Germany, it's not even possible to take your data across a state border, let alone the country border, right? Let alone that you can start mining it to do this kind of preventative actions that Bruce talks about. So I do think we need to come, um, mm. get to a breakthrough around connecting databases so that we can do the analytics and start understanding the patterns and you know the cohorts and the individual patients that need mm -hmm. to be touched. Second, um, you know, if, if we don't want these expensive patients to come too late to the emergency room, but rather get them to get more preventative care, then we need to reimburse that. And mm -hmm. even though the example suggests that that is possible, not at a large scale, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Philips partners with several large IDNs in the United States around telehealth, and telehealth has been a promise for a long time, but it's cost avoidance at best for the hospital. It is not a reimbursed kind of uh, right. uh, line item. So it's uh, not bringing the patient in and well, so incentivizing it. Yeah. At yeah. best, so cost avoidance, it's, right? It's not reimbursing right. the healthcare centers. Right. So a hospital that may do something just to avoid the patient coming back within the next 30 days. Right. But for a long-term, let's say, congestive heart failure patient, you need to start reimbursing uh, that provider. Mm -hmm. Uh, for doing the care at a distance. And I, I would imagine for cancer uh, that will not be different than for COPD patients. So I, I, I would I hope that we can also get breakthroughs on, on these systems. Right. I, I just wanted to bring up another huge risk factor. So along with what all of you have said, I mean, we know that about 40%, roughly 40% of healthcare dollars goes to the 5% of sickest patients. And those are patients who have multiple chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. But it turns out that the biggest risk factor for readmission to hospitals is mental health. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing about supporting and paying for mental health? Right. I think we mustn't forget that that is actually the biggest risk. It makes patients non-compliant with their medications, makes them not return to in, get... In the community, right? In mm -hmm. the community, yeah. yeah. So we've got well, to be thinking about that. I encourage you all to go to the session we're going to have on mental health tomorrow, and it's in your program, uh, about incorporating that into the value health uh, system. Um, do we have a question or a comment from a quick, you know, right here in the first row? Could you just identify yourself? Yes. Yeah. My name is Uh, we have a microphone for you. My name is Ayman Tamer from Saudi Arabia. I'm in the healthcare business. I find the biggest challenge will be in the client. Until we have technology that will allow us to reach to the patient mm -hmm. and carry out preventive medicine or preventive healthcare provision mm -hmm. at home, we're going to have a lot of resistance. Today, our country is facing a large transformation. And part of the Vision 2030, which is brilliant, is to transform the healthcare facilities from diabetes, the, um, all the radiology and so on. The point is, is that 
the client doesn't know the deliverables they want. Mm -hmm. And that's very risky. Even with education and RFPs, we're facing a big challenge. And I think that resistance will continue until we can surpass the client or override the client and go straight to the patient where we can extend our yeah. preventive health care. So I think that's a good question. So we want to talk about the fact that we have all this new technology that is going to put the patient more in the center of, of, of her care. Does somebody want to address that? Well, uh, you know, one thing, though, um, in, in all of this, the patient is at the center because you're measuring right. the patient's outcome and, and what it costs. In the end, the patient in some way. Right. either through their taxes or through direct payment in some countries. But in the end, the value is outcomes over cost. But I do want to make the point that in all of this, uh, you know, we want money, we want to be reimbursed, but we'll go down the same path unless the reimburse is reimbursement is tied to an outcome. Mm -hmm. You have to have that. And, and so the definition of the outcome, the baselining of the outcome, relevant to patients, uh, is, is the task that we're on, and that has to be a granular task. Mm -hmm. Th this is like disease by disease, condition by condition, and you know, you just gotta do this brick by brick. It's not gonna, there's no magic solution. Lori, I mean, the, the, the etiology of disease is multifactorial, and we, we know that we, you know, we've described this long process of the progression of so many chronic diseases. So how do you, how do we identify specific outcomes? I mean, maybe, maybe something is helping in some little way, or how do, how do we identify that? Well, I think it's easy to identify outcomes in cancer, mm -hmm. which is what we focus on. Does somebody's tumor regress or does it progress? Um, and we keep very careful records of that, but here's a perfect example of tying Mm -hmm. um, reimbursement to outcome, and that is the CAR T cells, right? So mm -hmm. we have two, there are two products on the market now. One is for your acute lymphocytic leukemia in kids and adults, and the other is from lymphoma. That's, um, <coughs> that's um, Novartis and uh, Gilead Kite. And what they have said is, here, the product costs $475,000 or $375,000, and we will only charge you for it if the patient responds. Mm -hmm. The patient doesn't respond, and these are desperately ill patients mm -hmm. for whom no other treatments have worked. They are on death's door. And there is an amazing response in a great, great number of patients, although there is some toxicity associated, but that is... That's, that's exactly, that's the exactly what yeah. you're saying, yeah. Omar. But yeah. that is, that's a challenge, though, because in, is particularly in the case of cancer, you could have a partial response for 30 days or yeah, whatnot. But, let me, let I mean, how do you... I mean, well, well, there are clinical yeah. trials that people do. Oh. Right. So, you know, all of us, uh, certainly pharmaceutical companies and device companies mm -hmm. and, uh, and equipment manufacturers, we do clinical trials. Clinical trials are science-based. But clinical trials are done under, under sort of protected conditions where mm. cohorts are clearly defined, outcomes are measured with discipline, mm. all the variables are managed. Translating that to the real world, those fundamental features have to be translated. Otherwise, if you just throw it into the real world, you'll treat the wrong people. Yeah. You, you need many more smaller, more efficient clinical trials. Yes. You need right. more phase one trials, and more quicker. basket trials. Adaptive you trials. You identify yeah. the yeah. genomics of a patient. You're able to predict mm -hmm. what they might respond to. And then you can do a very small trial, get the readout very quickly. And then you don't treat the other 95% yeah. of patients mm -hmm. who don't have that genetic. Right. Protein. And then translate that to a payment mechanism. Exactly. Rapidly. All right. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Um, I know. Well, I want to make sure we get one on this side, and then we'll come back. So how about uh, right here in the first row? Hi. My name is Andre. I'm a practicing oncologist in charge of a network city. In New Jersey, I have uh, two questions. One of them is that clearly we had an uh, inflection point in many aspects in medicine, and we talked about value-based care today. I'd like the panel to comment on new models of reimbursement and how we go away from fee-for-service and global reimbursement, and how we uh, apply this in the real world. And the second question is that what we are learning from the Western world trying to fix healthcare on how we can prophylactically, if you want to call it, expand this globally so that we don't have to relearn this in uh, other emerging countries. Okay, we only have 10 minutes, so, um, so we'll just I'll try, try yeah. to take yeah. it. I, I think what we've found um, in payers, I mean, in providers that are trying to move from a, a uh, fee-for-service dependent to a more value, 
based is that you have to take steps, and we call it path to risk. And um, so you'll have a base payment that would be more on fee-for-service orientation where there's a volume-based model to it. And then there are cost and quality indicators within that payment mechanism that then allows you to receive bonuses to that. So you don't, what in our industry the slang is, you don't take downside risk, you only take upside um, uh, benefit there. That's that's the beginning step, and then you just sort of adjust that over time, as you make make um, your um, changes in your infrastructure, your process flows, and your outcomes to take more and more risk, and you participate in more of the upside mm -hmm. um, and downside of the of the program. What we find is is it's a big change from fee for service, and a little bit I think what Cliff and the team uh, the panel was talking about, because you're used to billing and collecting, and you're used to maximizing the treatment mm -hmm. during that period of time. And that's sort of what your systems are built up. That's what your workflow is built around. That's what your informatics is built around, is how am I going to get paid for this, and how do I get it through the system? And, and it's a lot of war volume. What we find is when you get to the other side of the, the payment model, where it's more around value, whether it's in oncology and it's a bundled payment, or it's population health and a more primary care oriented uh, arrangement, it is much more around slower, more time with the patient so volume isn't there. It's more around quality indicators and downstream cost, and so you have to see beyond your walls and you have to see farther down. And you see, you have to see sort of the engagement of your, of your patient. Um, and that engagement is, is that if you send them to a specialist or a subspecialist, you need to make sure they get the appointment and they go to it. Um, and they are, they can afford the copay. If you give them medicine and a prescription, you make sure they get the prescription and they stay on it. And that downstream effect mm -hmm. and that volume versus quality of time with the patient is what we have found is the biggest change in the workflow and the data and the technology to make that as opposed to the payment. Everyone talks about the payment, but I got to tell you what I see is not the payment model that's driving it. It's the informatics, it's the measurement of the quality, mm -hmm. it's the workflow in the, in, the, in, the, in the model, and it's the risk you take of running from a volume-based mo model to more of a quality orientation to the engagement of the member or the patient. Okay, but, let's get, oh, go ahead, no, Lori. No, no. no, go ahead. Uh, okay, that, 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 that works, that's good, but what you're saying is spending more time with the patient. And that's the problem. Our physicians are burning out mm -hmm. because they don't have enough time to spend with the patient. But if they don't see more patients, we can't keep the hospital alive. So either one has to increase the amount of reimbursement so that it at least equals medical cost. Um, mm -hmm. So to allow physicians to see, and, and you know, at Dana-Farber, I have to say, we spend a lot of time with each patient, but our margin is razor thin because of that, and it's because of healthcare reimbursements in Massachusetts not keeping pace with So there, there, us. there, there, there have to be a profit and loss change in the whole system, right? right? Mm -hmm. Because also within hospitals, sometimes there are, there are profit centers. Right? And if you want to optimize the resource allocation along the health continuum of an individual patient, mm -hmm. you may want to redirect resources to the prevention or to, let's say, the counseling or the mental health. But that is not how the system works today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have to see a change in the p and management. Now, your second question with regard to emerging countries, very important. Right? And um, already we, we, we see a risk there because, you know, Emerging countries build hospitals, whereas they should build capacity for primary care in the community, mm -hmm. right, where um, we, we see a multidisciplinary approach to all the, the NCDs that are coming up uh, and to nip it in the bud. Right? But money for primary care in most emerging countries is not available. Uh, Philips has pioneered uh, community life centers uh, that actually will drive the economy of a village. Uh, but still, the initial financing of such a community life center is, is not resolved. We work together with the United Nations now and the World Bank to try to get the funding because it will be an economic stimulus as well as a life enhancer. Um, the, risk, the, the mistake would be to just build tertiary hospitals in big cities. Mm -hmm. We have time for one last question. Um, let's, any, any, right here in the first row. Hi. 
Uh, we get a mic here. Just please identify yourself. My name is Katya Iverson, and uh, I work for an organization called Women Deliver. We work to drive investment in uh, girls and women's health and rights and well-being. I work with several of the people on the, on the panel. My question is, can you apply a gender lens to what you have just said? Mm. If we look at the care system, we have a feminization of the, of the health workforce. We have the care in the families, and it's often taken care of by women. Mm. I know that the, the work that you have done in, in Kenya uh, in the community health also has a very strong gender angle. But I would love to hear the gender angle on some of the other points here, mm -hmm. also on the research. Well, let me talk briefly about the, the gender issue, which um, I see no gender bias in terms of taking care of women, certainly not at the institutions I've been at. Uh, so I don't see any gender bias there. Where there is gender bias, of course, is in senior leadership. Um, there are still a scarcity of women in senior leadership positions. And that's unfortunate because we need to be role models for all the new physicians and the new scientists that are coming online. Um, and that, you know, here we have 21% women at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, all of our co-chairs are women, and I applaud that. I think that's great. But we have a long ways to go. And, um, you know, I was at the Mercer breakfast this morning, and that was a topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. So, yes. You're absolutely right, and we need to do something about it. And that, in part, means putting our money where our mouth is in mm -hmm. terms of supporting the careers of young women. So it's so important that so many caregivers are women, okay. and, and that burden falls unduly on them. Um, we just have one uh, minute left. Um, I want to uh, alert you all to this fantastic report that is just being released today. If you go on top link, you can actually download a copy of this uh, report, Value in Healthcare. It's the second year report, and it's just hot off the press. I want to thank my extraordinary panelists, Lori, Franz, Omar, Bruce, and Christoph. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.